It's This Week in Creationism. I'm your host, Joel Duff, where we look at all things creationist over the past week. It's episode number four. Last week, we took a look at answers in Genesis, and this week, we're going to pay a little more attention to Creation Ministries International. We're going to see how they've taken a quite a bold stance on their support of COVID vaccines, and we'll see how that has uh, how that sits with their audience and maybe uh, compare that to Answers in Genesis and the approach of ICR. Uh, and then we'll also touch a little bit on Velikovsky and creationism. Uh, they've recently written about that and uh, maybe a couple other things. So let's get ourselves going here. And first up, let's talk about this uh, COVID vaccination and uh, the CMI stance on that. Uh, I was really intrigued by a, um, a, uh, a CMI's uh, Facebook post of about a week ago in which they um, announced that one of their featured um, employees, uh, Jonathan Safarti, um, had been on Dr. Brown's uh, podcast uh, and he was invited there to talk about and support of people getting vaccinated with the COVID vaccination. Now, this didn't surprise me that he would speak out on this topic because over the past year, CMI has uh, produced several in, uh, podcast videos that they have put on their, their homepage uh, supporting vaccines and also just in general talking about COVID uh, and the severity of COVID and really emphasizing the need to be uh, very careful with this disease. And it's not the flu. I mean, just a, a very strong emphasis on it being much more than the flu. And so I wasn't too surprised to see that he would continue to um, uh, talk about uh, COVID and SARS-CoV-2. And uh, I listened to his conversation with Dr. Brown and I, you know, say so I was... I found myself thinking he's right on most of the time. I mean, I could quibble with a few little things. Uh, many of you know that I've uh, I've spent a considerable amount of effort uh, in uh, understanding COVID and talking about COVID myself on the radio and in a variety of other places and on my blog. And I really find that um, Safardi knows a lot about uh, what he's talking about. And so this is really so I was I knew what the response was going to be because I'd seen the response earlier when they had posted uh, things, all of a sudden uh, commenters come out of the woods. And uh, just look down here and you can see uh, how many comments they got on their Facebook page, uh, 679 comments, uh, 174, well, I would say likes, but there's actually a lot of dislikes there, a lot of frowny faces. Um, this is a lot of comments for the answers, uh, uh, sorry, for the uh, Creation Ministries International um, uh, Facebook page. If, if you scroll up and down from this one, you'll find that most of their posts get, you know, 15 or 20 comments, maybe sometimes less than that, and maybe 100 likes, uh, a couple shares, right? All of a sudden, this thing just exploded uh, with conversation. Um, I even did something uh, a little unusual for me. I jumped in and actually supported Creation Ministries International and in what that they were what they were doing here, and responded to many of the criticisms that uh, were being thrown at uh, Creation Ministries International. Uh, they kind of heard a little bit of a smattering of of everything, everything from well, I'll say that one of the biggest things that people said was, you know, stay in your lane. You know, you you deal with creation you know, Genesis and uh, help us understand that topic. But this is outside of your realm uh, and you need to just stay out of this where people have different opinions and you shouldn't rock the boat. And uh, we're really disappointed that you would take up this particular topic. And, you know, it was obviously a huge turnoff for many of their followers. We also got uh, <laughs> at I don't no, I'm not going to laugh. It really isn't funny, um, but I think it's um interesting that uh, if you go down their comment stream here and you look at, at the kinds of things that they're upset that, that their readers are upset about um, they throw out arguments at CMI that are essentially most of the arguments that CMI uses uh, against other you know you know non young earth creationists um, things like uh, you know, you're just, uh, you know, why are you, uh, why, why do you believe the stat, you know, the, the majority, you know, opinion, right? You know, here's these academics saying things and you're trusting the academics. Um, you know, we shouldn't trust those, you know, 
And it just, I just, a, there was a, a litany of arguments for why you shouldn't listen um, to CMI on this particular topic. But as I said to a couple of their followers, I said, you know, they have the perfect right to talk about this topic. In fact, they should talk about this topic. They're, they are Christians who uh, deal with science and you're coming to them saying, we trust you on to, to help us interpret science with respect to scripture and how we should understand Genesis. And we trust you as scientists with the right worldview, right? You have the correct worldview in terms of understanding this world. And we trust you as scientists to talk about how great you are. And a lot of comments are like, you know, Sephardi, you're, you're so awesome and you're so right about everything. But, you know, on this particular topic, and I wanted to say, why do you place your why do you, why are these people placing their trust in es essentially non-christians in many cases right many uh so-called experts that are out there on the fringe uh on the fringes uh, of of you know talking about vaccines and covid and 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 all the different things that we should be doing about that and they're willing to follow those they're willing to listen to those other voices when here they have a Christian voice that they have placed their trust in for other things, and they're not really even willing to give them the time of day to listen to this particular um, podcast or any of the other podcast. I know they haven't listened to them because Dr. Safardi was very clear uh, in what he supports and what he doesn't support. And many of these um, commenters um, clearly had not listened, right? They just saw the, they saw the title, they saw that he was supporting vaccines, and they just instantly jumped to conclusions. Um, so that would, you know, that's disappointing, but it's not surprising. It, it is the type of conversation that we have. And it's just, it's interesting that uh, I, I find it fascinating and I find it encouraging that Creation Ministries International would risk what they're risking because they really are turning off a, a, a decent proportion of their followers who are very upset with what they're saying. Um, and these are potential donors. And uh, I, I think they know that they're saying something that's unpopular with possibly a majority of their viewership. Uh, and yet they're boldly saying this is what we see and we feel convicted to say this like we understand the science and they explain it very clearly um, um, rob carter and safari made a video in which they went through and explained sars cov 2 coronavirus went through all the stats talked about conspiracy theories and why these conspiracies were wrong and brought data with them all right they had stats charts they had read the literature uh, and I think really understood the literature very well and presented it very well, a very rational presentation. And yet the comment stream under it was just was just incredible. I mean, it was it was amazing how quickly they were dismissed despite being, um, you know, knowledgeable people in their field. And Christians, again, I'll say who in their reader's mind should have the right worldview and should at least get the benefit of the doubt. They should at least be heard and be able to, and, and somebody ought to be able to say, I, I should at least listen to these people, think through what they've said, rather than have this knee jerk reaction uh, to them. So with all that said, um, let's look at uh, creation, let's look at answers in Genesis. All right, so what are the other creation ministries doing so I'm, I'm just going to talk about uh, institutes for creation research and answers in genesis so if you do a search on answers in genesis website uh, here are the first responses uh, they have written about coronavirus uh, and viruses in general um, and they've responded to a variety of things but there's almost no mention of vaccines on their website at all in fact if you just look up vaccine on answers in genesis website they just don't touch the topic, all right? It's, it's like a little bit about vaccines, like maybe the measles vaccine, some historical perspective, but no obvious position on vaccines, that's for sure. And uh, they haven't said anything about the coronavirus uh, uh, vaccine. 
And their articles are mostly about like, how should we understand viruses? Because viruses seem really evil, so where do they come from? And their answer, of course, is that, well, Adam sinned and these things didn't used to be bad. They didn't used to hurt anybody or anything. And somehow their genetics got corrupted by Adam's sin and they become damaging to us. Uh, and so they're just a product of the corruption of the world. Um, and so they do a lot of focus on that and sort of like, you know, why do viruses exist, but don't really take any uh, particular position on how we should view this particular virus and what we should do about it. Um, although I would, I would argue that I, by not taking a position there, they are taking a position. Their position is we know our audience, <laughs> you know, we know, we know how they feel in general about vaccines and mask mandates and all these other things and so what we're going to do is we're just not going to rock the boat and uh, although i suspect that the leadership at answers and genesis and icr i think appreciate vaccines and the covid vaccine probably understand how they work probably have all taken the vaccine themselves uh, and yet they won't publicly talk about that and i think if asked what they're going to say is like, that's a personal decision. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to interject ourselves into this debate. That's not our place. Um, which really Ken Ham can't say that because he feels it's his place to tell everybody everything that they ought to think, right? It's answers in Genesis. It's, you know, he has a position on everything that's happening in society and how the Bible, how the Bible finds a way to tell us exactly what we should believe about that. But in this case, it's a little too dangerous, I think, to to uh, uh, take a take a particular position. Um, and that's, again, why I admire uh, CMI. I mean, they're they're saying um, the health of our readers is important to us, right? We care about the people that are reading our material, and we think that they should consider taking the vaccine um, if they are able to. I mean, they, they acknowledge there are some people that shouldn't take the, the vaccine, just like everybody would. Um, so here, okay, so here's here's a variety of So there's you don't glean a whole lot from these titles from Answers in Genesis. Again, there's not a lot that they say there. You kind of have to read between the lines. And the best place to do that would be um, uh, Ken Ham, last November, so end of November. This is right before the vaccine uh, uh, was actually, actually came out. And he had put, I remember he put this on Facebook, his 14-year-old uh, granddaughter um, had written um, a letter and he went ahead and published it on his uh, Facebook page because he thought it was so good. And then he decided he needed to share it on the Answers in Genesis website. And let's just take a little little look at some of this because let's face it, it's his 14-year-old granddaughter who's doing a project for school, uh, supposed to respond to a couple Bible verses and how she felt about them, how it made her feel. And uh, a 14-year-old, uh, where do you think they get their particular views on, on you know, social issues and uh, vaccines and masks and all that? I mean, where, where are they going to get their view? And they're getting it from the home, right? I mean, this is, uh, this is schooling. This is train up your child. So I think what we see through her words are really what she has heard, right? What she has heard in the Ham household. So... Um, Hey, well, let's start halfway down here. Well, no, let's start at the beginning. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about the COVID. Um, where you'll find your toilet paper, right? That's funny. That was the original you know, problem with, uh, with COVID, right? Whether or not schools will stay open or wondering if these masks really work. Is it not more? Is, it, is, there, is, is not life more than Corona? And the body more than perishable goods? Look at South Dakota. They neither worry nor shut down. That's a pretty blatant uh, political statement right there, right? Look at South Dakota. They neither worry nor shut down. Maybe we should follow their advice, right? And, and, and just stay open and not take the precautions that others are taking. But if God supplied food and shelter for China, will he not do the same to you? O oh, ye of little faith, therefore, do not be anxious about having no vaccines for COVID or wearing masks that don't work or being stuck in your house, right? We seek relief from these things and your heavenly father knows that. 
but seek first not for paper towels, which everyone else, which ever, which everyone else is, but seek God and His kingdom. For all these things will be added to you. I understand the sentiment of the of of the overall message here, and I, I think that's good that we shouldn't worry that we should be content in our in our situation. Um, but there's a clear, um, you know, behind this is this idea that uh, um, we should just relax, right? You know, we don't need to be, you know, God will take care of us. And uh, if you were meant to get coronavirus, you were meant to get coronavirus. If you're meant to die, you're meant to die, right? Um, we shouldn't be putting ourselves through all these troubles. And I think this is further reflected in the overall policy. Like, say, if you go to the Ark Encounter, this is just from yesterday, and you look at what their policy is, it's actually hard to find. They don't talk about COVID anywhere on the website. Uh, you have to dig down a couple layers, and eventually you find on this tips page for coming to the Ark, this statement about healthy, being healthy at the Ark. And all it says is, hey, the, the state of Kentucky has this particular rule, and we're going to follow it. Right. And their and their rule is pretty laxed. Right. You know, the, the, they're, they're, you know, we're able you're able to make your own determination as to whether you need to wear a mask indoors or outdoors and social distance to prevent the spread of COVID. It's up to you. Right. It's a personal decision. We want everyone to have an enjoyable time and ask that guests be respectful of one another and our staff regarding the use of face coverings or not while at the uh, attraction. All capacity restrictions have been lifted. Right. We're in Kentucky, where actually the virus is is uh, very prevalent right now and has one of the highest, probably one of the higher rates right now in the United States. And their governor there is pleading for people to be careful. But at the Ark Encounter, it's well, this is the letter of the this is the the you know, this is what we have to do. Right. Which isn't much. And so we're not going to go above and beyond that. We're just going to say this is it. And we're going to say be respectful, which is great. But I think the sentiment there is um, if you see somebody with a mask on, please be respectful and don't make fun of them because most of us don't have masks on. And please, if you have a mask, don't complain to our staff that they're not wearing masks, uh, uh, you know, for your safety. Um, let's everybody just be happy. And you each have your own, you know, you each have your own position on this. All right. Now I realize that I am being, uh, you know, in my voice and tenor, being um, subjective and and somewhat judgmental on on these particular positions. So let me just back off and just say and just make the observation that these are two very different approaches from two creationist organizations. Uh, one very much hands off. We're not going to be involved. We're not going to tell um, um, our followers what they should be doing. Um, and I think that's unfortunate because there, you know, clearly Ken Ham is in a position of great power. I mean, if he were to come out and say, you, you know, we believe that masks are really important and we believe that, you know, vaccines are a, a great way that God has provided for us to to protect ourselves. That would probably go a long way to helping his probably low percentage vaccine um, uptake audience uh, to possibly get the vaccine, whereas CMI knows their audience also has probably uh, a relatively low uptake of the vaccine and they're promoting it. That's a, that's a huge difference uh, in approach between these two. I'm just tossing in here too, like I just looked at the Cleveland Museum of Art, um, great art museum, free art museum up in uh, Cleveland. If you're anywhere in the, in the Ohio area, you really got to go. Um, and you know, so the, the difference in language is really striking to me. You know, they, um, and you could say that, well, they're just saying that just to be nice. But here he is. This isn't a Christian organization, but at least they want it, They make it sound like they actually care about the people that come, you know, to their museum. Right. Their top priority is safety to visitors, volunteers and staff. And they explain why they're requiring masks again. And, and this is for your own good. And they have the plexiglass up and this is what we're going to do. And, um, you know, it's it's. Um, they're going a little bit beyond actually what the letter of the law requires of them um, because they want to do more, right? Rather than just let's get away with the least we can. All right, I'll get off my uh, soapbox now. Let's, uh, let's go down and let's talk about something else. All right, we're sticking with CMI. 
Um, vying with Velikovsky. All right, what does CMI think? So they got a letter. Um, you know, they, they, they take letters uh, that people write them all the time, have questions, and somebody had, had noted that they uh, uh, were reading up on Velikovsky and was really surprised to find out that uh, CMI had some supportive articles uh, of Velikovsky. And so Gavin Cox of CMI responded. And um, so Velikovsky is famous for his Worlds in Collision book from, uh, I think it's 1950. And in that, he proposed that, uh, well, the catastrophism, I mean, that, that major catastrophes in the solar system are responsible for many of the, the things that we see today in terms of our own development uh, uh, as a planet. Uh, and he borrowed stuff from, you know, not just he, he he used things from the Bible to support that. Like he would try to explain various um, phenomena uh, in the Bible, uh, like Noah's flood and so forth, as worlds that are um, passing, like Venus passing by the Earth and then creating this disruption in the in the in the water and so forth, and causing tsunamis and and. And so what happened was, is his ideas got very, very popular, like really popular. Catastrophism kind of took off as a, well, you know, think of it as today's uh, whatever the favorite uh, conspiracy is today, right? That becomes very, very popular to the point where people don't think it's a conspiracy um, um, or pseudoscience because so many people are buying into it. That's sort of where Velikovsky got to. Um, and... What's really great about the CMI article is I appreciate the fact that in their article, they actually talk about how many Christians were understandably drawn to the concept of revising Egyptian history from its timeline to fit the biblical dates. That's what Velikovsky did some timeline revision, and that helps creationists because they have difficulty fitting that entire Egyptian chronology into their 4,350-year history since the flood. There's another area where Velikovsky sought to revise and resulted in a particular sway in Christian circles. If you, uh, uh, let's see what I was gonna say. Um, oh, here's, here's you, you will notice that older articles tend to be more in favor of Velikovsky, um, but the newer articles, not so. They admit right here that if you searched for Velikovsky on their website, you'd find some somewhat favorable articles. And, you know, they talk about a number of creation researchers were unfortunately sidetracked by Velikovsky's ideas and they've been held up uh, as some of the most infallible uh, by well-meaning evangelical thinkers, enthusiastic about supporting um, biblical supporting ideas. In other words, his ideas, some of them seem to support, you know, actual events in the Bible and people glommed on to him like, oh, yeah, yeah, that must be what happened because that 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 supports the Bible. And they weren't critical of the idea and really testing that idea. Uh, and of course, pseudoscience is easy to identify when you look back upon it. And it was like, well, how could they possibly believe that? But when you think about all the pseudoscience today, and I would include a good portion of creation science in that, uh, and you, it's, it's difficult to identify in the moment. I mean, everyone who thinks that they know what pseudoscience is by looking in the past sometimes can't recognize it in their own present. Um, uh, at, which reminds me, you really need to read this book, all right? really recommend Michael Gordon's uh, book, The Pseudoscience Wars, and he develops the whole story of, or the whole history of Velikovsky and like how he came to prominence, why so many people eventually came to support that. He has some very interesting chapters on like how to identify pseudoscience. It's not a trivial thing um, because brilliance and new ideas can seem pseudosciency at first and maybe, and, and pan out eventually. I mean, I, I'm sure some and he points out that some of Einstein's ideas would have would have smacked of some parts of pseudoscience at one point in time. But of course, he, he, he played out to be all right. So how do you actually identify pseudoscience? And that's that's kind of why I said it's easy to identify pseudoscience looking in the rear of your window. Um, it's hard to maybe know it in the moment. But he gives a lot of tips for typical things that are, you know, typical <laughs> of, of pseudoscience uh, when you're there. And he ends his book actually with, by talking about uh, various forms of creationism and what parts of pseudoscience that kind of fit uh, that pattern and, and a couple interesting warnings in there. And someday I'll, I'll review that book and talk about it more. It's really, uh, it's really a fascinating read and it was very helpful to me. 
All right, let's move on. One more. Um, yeah, The Dread of Man, part one. I can hardly wait for part two to find out what the, the rest of The Dread of Man is. Uh, the Dread of Man is about um, why animals fear man. Um, was the dread, fear and dread of man in the animals after Noah's flood something new God specifically brought about? That's the question being asked here. Um, I think it's actually a, 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 it's an intriguing question, and I was thinking I can't think of anyone who's written about this specifically, so I was kind of interested to open this up and find out what they were talking about. Uh, and so I'll just show you the abstract um, for the sake of time and, and say, like, well, maybe this will pique your interest. And maybe you'll want to come see part two when it comes out. Uh, after reading part one, I'm like, yeah, I got to read part two because I'm not exactly sure where he's going. But I want to draw your attention to one thing. Um, in Genesis, uh, well, in Genesis 9, 2, uh, God does talk about the fear and dread of mankind would be on, on, on man. Uh, after after the flood and down here at the bottom here uh, let's read the sentence here God supernaturally altered animal psychology when lifting the bar against humans eating meat in Genesis 1 28 okay so you see what he's saying there God supernaturally altered animal psychology um, so creationists generally of course believe that all animals were good in the sense of being perfect not able to die, wouldn't have harmed each other, and wouldn't have harmed humans, and humans didn't eat animals. But then after Genesis 1, 28, all right, and you have sin entering into the world, well, then you have meat eating potentially, and you also have death. And so where did... Um, where did that where did that how did that change happen he's suggesting that's a supernatural change i'm not sure all other creationists are gonna be too thrilled with this because a lot of them will say that like there was stuff pre-programmed in the dna and then when sin happened that was a trigger but they would still maybe try to explain it as a natural trigger somehow that then tripped a bunch of genes which then caused different kinds of features to be expressed in organisms that then allowed for carnivory and competition and natural selection to happen um, and so I found that interesting that he's just just saying right out front that this is a supernatural altering of the psychology of organisms and it's like what but what makes the psychology of an animal right is 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 every thought you know when an animal decides to go this direction or that direction or to behave toward you in one way versus another like your your dog at home is, is each one of those different um, things that they do, is that that's supernaturally caused God directing each one of those in a supernatural way? Or ultimately, is it still programmed in his brain, uh, in their brain as, a, as genetic code, right? That there's a code that, that God ordained them with, but that guides their thinking and response types, right? Because it's a, it's a chemical response. When they see something, they go, oh, avoid this. No, attack this. Um, but now he's saying, no, there's a supernatural altering of that, of the psychology. So I guess that could be a supernatural altering of the brain chemistry all of a sudden. Like, snap my fingers, all of a sudden those, those organisms are changed. And presumably that would be like changing a bunch of genetic code and, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm thinking through my genetics class and I don't want to go into all that language <laughs> here. So. Uh, oh, and then reading on, part one of this paper begins to explore this proposal, including the, o the overview of the thoughts of previous biblical commentators on these verses, anticipating objections and exploring unanswered comprehension. It, he's going to try to, to explore this idea that it could be supernatural, and he's going to say that even in Genesis 9-3, after the flood, that might have been a supernatural event causing the fear of animals, right? So originally... In Genesis 1 28 there might have been a, something supernatural but then after the flood God also supernaturally changed animals to give them a different relationship um, to man uh, I'll be intrigued in part two to see um, how he thinks this happens and whether that's a I don't know an intelligent designed thing that can be explored 
All right, I'm not sure what else to say about that. Um, yeah, some interesting stuff at CMI anyway, the last uh, couple days. So that's that's it for me. There's a ton going on, and I'm I really want to talk about these footprints that have been found just um, or just revealed yesterday in a paper in Science in New Mexico and their age and how that would relate to the chronology that young earth creationists have for um, the peopling of North America and how challenging this particular uh, new set of footprints and that specifically the dating of them is going to be for them. But I don't really want to say anything about that until they say something about it and then we can talk about it. So whatever week they talk about it, I'm sure there's going to be some kind of article in response to that. Um, and there's a couple other big news items uh, that are out there uh, that I think that uh, will pique the interest of creationists and they won't be able to help but respond to it. Oh, the other one would be the the, the news that uh, 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 cities around the Dead Sea could have been completely obliterated by a cosmic airburst uh, and the possible relationship of that to Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's something that uh, I think, I mean, I think all Christians are going are, are gonna to be thinking about in trying to wrestle with in terms of a like identifiable, scientifically identifiable event and how that meshes with um, the description of Sodom and Gomorrah and God's involvement with the cause of that event or what, what people have usually envisioned as being um, what that event might have looked like. So anyway, there's I'm sure there's uh, stuff coming down the line and uh, when uh, when they comment on it, then we'll take a look and see what they say and see you know whether it makes sense or not. All right, thanks a lot for uh, hanging in there. And um, if I didn't drive you too crazy, you and it's the first time you're listening to me, you could uh, hit that subscribe button. You know wherever it is, somewhere around here, I think. All right, bye bye.